Happy Wednesday, everyone. Welcome to another Brain Scratch Searchlight update on the case of Maya Miliete, also known as May. This is a case, quite honestly, where there's kind of constant information that's coming out. And right from the start, of course, a lot of suspicions are looking in the husband's direction. It just seems like the more information that comes out, it seems like that's a very strong focus of the investigation. And honestly, I'm starting to wonder at this point, is this potentially going to be processed as a, a prosecution for a nobody homicide or something of that nature? If nothing else, I would imagine that Maya's family has a lot of circumstantial evidence that might help in a civil suit for a wrongful death or something of that nature. But today, we've got details that are pretty disturbing, very much focused on guns and a little bit into Larry's past as well. So uh, let's go ahead and get to the articles and take a look at what the latest is with this case. And just so you guys know, I'm going to try to keep you updated. Uh, the police are saying they're doing updates every two weeks. Um, they're not always significant updates. So uh, Christy's been working really hard keeping me up to date with all the latest that's happening on this. I'm keeping an eye out for updates as well. And when I see that there's significant things like we have to review here today, we'll go ahead and do another update on this case because there's just a lot of moving parts that are going on with this. Maya Miliete, missing from Chula Vista, California since January 2021. If you're not familiar with the case, I'll have our original episode and the last update we did in the description box down below. Pause this one, go check those out, come back for the latest. All right. So starting, and a big thank you to CBS8.com. We're using a lot of different articles that they've put together. One of the things we see, uh, law enforcement certainly still actively working this case. This is an update from April 14th, 21. We're seeing that there's another search warrant that's been served, but this one not at Maya and Larry's house. News 8 has learned investigators seized evidence this month from the home of Maya's husband's aunt and uncle. On April 1st, Chula Vista police showed up to serve a search warrant, seizing about a half dozen long rifles and boxes of evidence. Property records showed the house is owned by Ricky Lincoln, 66 years old, better known as Uncle Ricky to Larry Miliete. Miliete's aunt, Kathy Lincoln, also lives in the house, according to Billy Little, an attorney working with Maya's family. Of course, we talked a lot about Billy on the last update episode because a lot of the information was coming from Billy's observations. Uh, Ricky and Kathy Lincoln did not respond to News 8 messages seeking comment. They have not been named by CVPD as suspects in the case. No one has been arrested. So just want to be very clear. There's something about, obviously, the weapons and possibly some other evidence that's been taken from their home. But in terms of them having any you know, criminal liability or aspect in this, nothing like that is coming out here. So... Uh, that's not the only warrant we're going to be talking about today and not the only gun either. We get this very disturbing clip. Essentially, a neighbor has a security camera. The night that Maya goes missing, that camera picks up some uh, noises and there is a forensic expert that's looking into those noises. Before we see his comments, let's go ahead and listen to these noises for ourselves. Obviously, very disturbing. Uh, what are the experts saying about those noises? Are they actually gunshots? We're going to get to that in a moment. But I can tell you, and I'm not sure if this is coming across in the recording that you guys are seeing here on YouTube. Uh, for me, listening to that through a sound system with the volume relatively high, uh, I'm hearing other background noises that might be related to that or not. I mean, obviously, yes, we hear that there's a dog in the neighborhood that's barking around all this. Keep in mind, this is 9.57 p.m. on January 7th. Um, but there's other noises that I don't think are a dog that I'm hearing as part of that background. Could that possibly be analyzed 
and help with this as well. Uh, let's go ahead and get to the details of the article and what the expert is saying. Eight loud bangs recorded in Maya Miliete's neighborhood on the night she went missing have been identified as gunshots by a forensic audio expert. Brian Neumeister, CEO of USA Forensic LLC in Phoenix, Arizona, says they are gunshots. I don't have a question about that. They do sound like they're indoors, at least the first few of them. I haven't analyzed them completely, but it definitely sounds like it's inside a house. I'm going to be able to clarify, get rid of all the background noise. If there's something like a human voice, I'll be able to spot that quite easily. Even if it's buried, I'll be able to bring that out, says Newmeister. I have to clean it up enough that there's no question of what's there, and that's something I do every day. Now, I saw some more interview with this expert talking about the clip, and basically, he's only analyzed a few of the very first shots, and he's already convinced that those are gunshots. But as of when that interview was being done, he hasn't analyzed the whole piece. The pieces that I'm hearing that I think it, there might be a person's voice or something like that, they're actually much later, and I don't know if he's gotten to process those yet as of when this article is written. Uh, it seems like really between the last few, there's some other noise that's going on there. It could be a male voice, um, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure on that. All eight shots are heard over a period lasting 79 seconds. 79 seconds sure seems like it's a long time when you're hearing something that you think is gunshots like that. Uh, and it's possible that we're hearing the last moments of, of Maya's life. It's possible. Continuing over to San Diego Union Tribune, uh, police are analyzing the bangs recorded on the security system. What is their official stance on this? This article is from April 21st. These bangs are being reviewed and analyzed by investigators in the hope of determining if they were gunshots, says Police Lieutenant Dan Peake in a statement. It's also important to note the Chula Vista Police Department did not receive any report of gunshots during the night in question, and these bangs were discovered by investigators early on in the investigation. So as of April 21st, when this article was written, uh, police have released that they've had investigators interview 55 individuals, written 16 search warrants, and reviewed more than 40 tips. And I've seen some updates on that at this point. I think they've interviewed a few more people. Uh, I know of at least one other search warrant that has been written and served since this. And I think at this point, they're up to somewhere around 55 tips that have been processed. Uh, then we hear about something that happens frequently in cases like this, skeletal remains being found in a nearby area. People start thinking, is that Maya? Uh, the discovery of skeletal remains in Orange County had some people in San Diego County worried, but the Huntington Beach Police Department confirmed Tuesday the decomposed body was that of a male. Now, Huntington Beach, not exactly close to San Diego, but remember, we've got this kind of mystery time frame where Larry says the following morning... He took his four-year-old to a beach somewhere. Um, he was gone for approximately 12 hours, didn't take his cell phone, so we can't track his movements. So honestly, I mean, that's a lot of time. And from San Diego, he could have easily, I, I'm pretty sure that they would have checked the border crossings, but he could have gone into Mexico, could have come up to Los Angeles with that much time, maybe even a, a little north of that, maybe as far as Santa Barbara with that much time. Uh, or of course, if he cut east, many different locations. Uh, you're talking a huge, huge area. So I understand why, you know, something happening in Huntington Beach is grabbing the attention of people on social media thinking maybe, maybe this is Maya. Um, a little more on Larry's background. Maya Miliete's husband arrested as a juvenile. Uh, he was 15 at the time of the incident. It occurred on the evening of April 30th, 1997 in the San Diego neighborhood of Bay Terraces. The 17-year-old victim of the attack suffered multiple stab wounds and was rushed to Mercy Hospital, where he eventually recovered. Billy Little Jr., the attorney that's working with Maya's family, said, It's my understanding this was a gang-related incident. There were multiple other people around, said Little. He was taken into custody as a juvenile. It was a long time ago, and what you're looking for is, who is this person? Who has he grown up to be? Has he learned from his past criminal conduct, said Little, referring to Larry. Uh, juvenile court records in the case are sealed, so obviously we can't come to a very strong determination of whatever happened, um, how long he might have been in juvenile hall, 
other possible conditions of his release, anything like that. According to family members following Larry Moliette's release from Juvenile Hall, he moved with his parents to Hawaii. That's where Larry met his future wife, Maya, in high school. Aside from two traffic tickets in Riverside County, Miliete apparently had no more run-ins with the law, Larry specifically. Um, so a little bit of background, uh, you know, a violent attack when he was a teenager, seems like it was gang related. Is that necessarily making him look more like a suspect in this case? I, you know, I don't know how strong that is, but um, it's, it's just a little more background on Larry. And the family had to celebrate Maya's 40th birthday uh, without her, uh, May 1st, 2021. And of course, this past weekend, we had Mother's Day, of course, which would have been another celebration that Maya probably would have spent with her family and friends. But May 1st, 2021, family, friends, and complete strangers came to Fiesta Island on Saturday to celebrate her. May 1st is Maya's 40th birthday. On its face, it's a luau on a sunny day. Hawaiian and Filipino food cooking on a barbecue and kids playing volleyball. May 1st was all about honoring Maya. The many volunteers that have spent their days dedicated to finding Maya were welcomed with open arms and appreciation from the people who knew her best. And let me just emphasize um, the search efforts by the family have been strong. They've been consistent, well supported by friends and community members. So this was kind of special for them to actually decide, hey, we're going to take this day, honor Maya, not press really hard on the search effort, but give a big thank you back to everyone that's really helping with those search efforts. So um, I just really appreciate how this family has been dealing with this, processing this, and trying to move this case forward. And that includes being a bit vocal, um, being sure to put some pressure in terms of what's happening with law enforcement. We're going to hear a little bit a little bit more about that here in some of these articles. Over at NBCSanDiego.com, Saturday, May 7th, that was four months to the day since anyone saw Maya Miliete. Her family held another rally outside the headquarters of the Chula Vista Police Department. A news release sent out shortly before the rally struck a bit of a vocal tone. Quote, we need the city of Chula Vista Council to step up and advocate for the family. If CVPD does not have the resources, then it's up to the city council to provide the needed funding and resources to enable the CVPD to be better equipped to support the ongoing investigation and search efforts. There is a mountain of evidence and there have been no arrests made. We fear for the emotional and psychological well-being of the children. Maya's family has not seen the children or had any contact with them since Maya went missing. Larry Miliete is not willing to cooperate with the family and the authorities. At the rally, family members criticized the department's communication and transparency with the family and public. Now, honestly here, I understand, you know, having to be a voice of a, a little bit of pressure towards the investigation, you know, just reminding them the family is hurting, the family's looking for answers. There's a lot of information. They're saying a mountain of evidence, absolutely. Missing pieces to this story, yes. But I have to say for the cases that we look into here, there's been a lot of information that's kind of constantly coming out about this case. Admittedly, not all of it's coming from CVPD. Uh, Billy Little has been a pretty strong source of information in this case as well. Uh, the family worked very, very hard and still to this day, but initially in terms of rallying press support, uh, the family was working directly with the news agencies doing interviews. Um, so, you know, I'm just trying to be fair about this type of investigation. This is a tough investigation. This is something that happens within a home. And I don't want to harp on this too much. I know I've talked about it in the other videos. Um, and of course, we don't know where Maya is. But that's why I'm bringing up the possibility, especially when you have as much information. I won't even say evidence at this point, but just the information that's coming out through media. Imagine how much more they have actually in the police file. Are they going to be able to run this as a no-body homicide at some point? It's just a big question that is, is really sticking with me right now. So what's their issue in particular about the communication and transparency with the family? They make a great point here. This is by Richard Droulet, who is Maya's brother-in-law. They haven't told us where they've searched. 
That's why we say it's a one-way communication with the police department. We don't want to step on each other's feet. If you search in one area, please let us know. That way we don't have to waste our time. Um, which is obviously a great point. And to his point, the other side of that is what if they go searching in, air, in an area and they contaminate the scene in some way, and then later, you know, an official search goes on there and there's problems with it because of the volunteer search that happened earlier. Quite honestly, I don't know how strong the search efforts are on the police department's part for this type of investigation at this point. Um, because of that big time frame, because of the serious amount of area that we're talking about, unless they're getting very specific information about where he went, you know, like uh, they find a gas station and they're like, hey, we can tell that he filled up at this gas station on this day at this particular time. We need to go looking in that area. I just can't imagine how the police would even focus uh, the, or, or find locations that they could trust. Hey, we need to do a search in this area. You know, let's pull out all those resources because this area is looking good. At least from the information coming out through the media, this is just a very, very tough search for Maya. Uh, CVPD's update did include a statement from Chief Roxana Kennedy. She says, we understand the frustration over limited public information about the case. We will not share any information publicly about this case that can in any way hinder or jeopardize the successful investigation and potential prosecution of anyone involved in her disappearance. Recently, we have begun working with the Cold Case Foundation to provide advocacy to May's family in conjunction with our investigation. And I'm glad to hear that. Uh, I'm familiar with the Cold Case Foundation. I've been in touch with someone that works there fairly regularly. And... Um, it's one of those things, if law enforcement is having a resource issue, if there is another organization that can step up and help with something like that in particular, kind of be a little bit of a case manager right in the middle there, someone that has an open channel with law enforcement can maybe field some of those questions through, gets that information, feeds it back to the family, keeps them up to date regularly. What a great service that is. So I really appreciate the Cold Case Foundation stepping up on this. Another search warrant served back at the home of Maya and Larry. May 7th, 2021, police served a search warrant at the home. Lieutenant Frank Giami, a department spokesman, declined to disclose what prompted the new search. And literally, for this article, that's all in terms of information. So it, it didn't come out very quick, but information did come out in the following days over at Crime Online. The husband of a California woman who has been missing since early January had a temporary gun restraining order issued against him last week. The restraining order accused Larry Milliette of having an illegal assault weapon or unregistered firearms. Quote, after a search warrant was executed at respondent's residence, respondent told the officers that he knew they were coming for his firearms and he gave multiple firearms to his friends, the document states. So I think now we understand the search warrant that happened at his uncle's house, guns that were recovered from there. But how many guns are we talking about to the point where they're actually putting a restraining order on Larry from having, and why, why would there be a restraining order all of a sudden uh, stopping him from purchasing more weapons? Larry Milliette allegedly refused to tell police who he gave the guns to. Uh, okay, jumping over to CBS 8. Can we learn more about this aspect? A missing page of the original application for a gun violence restraining order against Larry was posted Monday on the San Diego County Superior Court website, alleging that the father's four-year-old son was in extreme danger because of the child's access to a cache of weapons and ammunition. We're not just talking about a gun or two here. We're talking about a significant amount. A photograph allegedly downloaded by police from Larry Milliette's cell phone on January 23rd showed the boy standing on a kitchen table with a cache of 16 firearms, four United States passports, a government identification card, several high-capacity magazines, and hundreds of rounds of ammunition, according to this newly released uh, court record. Uh, and the photograph timestamped January 9th, 2020. That is a terrifying image uh, just to think of a four-year-old being around that type of weaponry. I'm understanding why that restraining order is being put into place. And, uh, you know, where are those weapons now? He's handing them out to friends. 
that means he still has access to them. I'm sure it's just a, a drive for him to go and pick them up again. Um, back to another quote. Uh, the cache of firearms included two short-barreled AR-15 illegal assault weapon platforms, five undetermined legality AR-15 platform rifles, three pump shotguns, one bolt-action rifle with a scope, five semi-automatic -autom handguns. Um, we're talking about a significant amount of weaponry. Now, back in January on the 23rd, they did do a first search warrant. And at that time, did they get some of the guns? Uh, at that time, they got an illegal assault rifle as well as two Glock handguns. Um, but the picture obviously was taken a week, a little more than a week before this. Um, so we're talking three of the weapons out of the 16 that they're noting in that picture. Sounds like they got two more over at the uncle's house. There's still a lot of them out there. In the May 5th application for the restraining order, an officer wrote the father of three children may own as many as 20 firearms and 18 remain unaccounted for, according to the records. Now, uh, some more information. Larry also has a military record, and that includes a pistol sharpshooter ribbon. Military records released to News 8 under a Freedom of Information Act request showed no disciplinary actions against Larry Milliette during his five years of service in the U.S. Navy from 2000 to 2005. Uh, Larry Milliette's DD Form 214 indicated he received a Navy and Marine Corps Achievement Medal in 2003, a Good Conduct Medal, a National Defense Service Medal, a Global War on Terrorism Medal, and a pistol sharpshooter ribbon. Um, you know, just looking at a case like this, knowing that we're, we've got this surveillance footage, sounds like there's gunshots. Um, we now are seeing a little bit more about Larry's past. Uh, there's just a lot of things that are pretty terrifying about how this is all looking at this point. From the first video that I did on this case, looking into this information, it just seems like with every update, things feel worse and worse and worse. But does that mean that we're getting closer and closer to the truth? That's really what I'm hoping for with this latest round of information. Uh, I hope that they can identify those gunshot sounds and maybe pick up some sounds around that. Uh, I really feel like there's something around that last, the last few in particular, maybe the experts will be able to pick up something from that. Um, where are all these other weapons? What was the intent of that photo? Why do you have the passports out like that? It's got me thinking about that border not being so far away. And maybe um, was, was Maya moved across the border? It's just another possibility I can't quite shake from my mind. I would just think that the surveillance at the border would be so tight that they would know already. Uh, and maybe they do. Maybe they do know that he did cross the border and they're just not coming out with that publicly. Um, but with this investigation, just right from the start, everything has been so focused on Larry. And with all the media that's coming out since then, it's like that focus is just getting sharper and sharper and sharper. Um, I don't know. I've, I've never quite seen anything like this. Uh, of course, in another effort to just be amazing about how they're going about this case, the family has now put together a website specifically for Find Maya Milliete at findmayamilliete.com. Uh, so I'll have a link to that down below. The donation button clicks to their GoFundMe that we've already donated to. Um, they're doing a little blog here where you can keep up to date with the family. They've got an event section they haven't filled out yet, but I know with their search efforts, that's going to get filled out. And if you want to volunteer on those efforts, it's probably a good place to come and check that out. Of course, if you have information about this case, please call it in. The contact info that you need is in the description box down below. Take care, everybody. I'll be back on Friday with a brand new mystery right here on the Lord and Arts channel.